Okay, thanks, Alan. Um, I'm going to talk today about a, an area of Queensland that many of you have prob probably been to, but m probably very few realise the, the uh, rare metal potential of this place. It's a fairly spectacular landscape, as you can see. And this work was really done by uh, this guy, Ross Chandler. So I'm really presenting it on his behalf. This was his honours project from last year, looking at some of these volcanics in central Queensland. Uh, and it's really about rare metal potential, or in particular rare earths. So I'm going to talk a little bit about rare earths, one of my favourite subjects. Um, these are sort of uh, become a little bit of trendy metals these days, and they're a little bit considered a little bit unstable. But the long-term trend here is going to be pretty strong. Uh, the way our society is going, we're going to need a lot of these things. So here's a couple of uh, examples here. So the top one is showing um, this plot here. You might not be able to see the lines very well, but the, that's showing basically the uptake of electric vehicles in various parts of the world over the next uh, 20, 30 years or so. And what you see going up to 100% there is that in many places in the world by 2035, 2040, uh, electric vehicles will be essentially 100% of all cars sold on the, on the road. Uh, in Australia, the Labor government announced that it wanted 50% uh, of cars in, Aust in Australia to be electric vehicles by 2030. Now, they didn't get voted in, but the reality is the projection isn't far off that anyway. We're going to be not far behind these curves. At, and that's not just uh, projections for, for things like car makers. Uh, that's also becoming policy. So this thing here, this uh, diagram is showing various uh, governments around the world that are going to be putting bans on ICEs, which stands for in internal combustion engines. So petrol and diesel cars are basically on the way out. So by 2050, we're mostly going to see electric cars. So bans means bans altogether. So you won't be able to, to drive them at all. So for this to happen, as well as uh, all of the uh, the transition to clean energy that's going to go on, we need a lot of rare earths. So rare earths are needed for the magnets, for the batteries um, that are going to drive these vehicles. Uh, and that's a little bit of a concern because at the moment, whoops, I shouldn't have pressed that. How do we get rid of that? I've got the arrow back, but I don't really want it. Oh, there we go. Now I've got an arrow. Um, there is an issue with supply. Uh, at the moment, most rare earths come out of China, and this is obviously a concern given the current state of the, the uh, trade wars between China and the US. China is threatening to cut demand, and you can see why that's an issue. Well, there's an issue anyway, irrespective of that. So this is dysprosium, so this is a heavier rare earth that is needed for, uh, for magnets, high-powered magnets that go with neodymium to make sure they work at high temperature. And China's production of dysprosium is dropping, and that's largely because they're cutting down on uh, mining iron absorption clays, which are environmentally damaging. And you can see where the demand is going in the opposite direction. At the moment, there's very little alternative supply um, out there, and so there is a growing problem here. So that's not unique for dysprosium. That's for most of the rare earths uh, kind of in that um, ballpark. So we need for rare earths. And luckily, Australia can um, probably fill that gap. We already are filling that gap. There's a couple outside of China with a major producer of rare earths. Uh, this map is just showing you where our rare earth ore deposits are, hard rock rare earth ore deposits, color coded by the geology. So in uh, yellow dots are carbonatite hosted things. In Queensland, we've got uh, SCARN and ISCGs in Mary Kathleen and Milo in the Mount Isa inlier. Those two are probably not going to be economically viable for mining rare earths. Um, Mary Kathleen has already been mined for uranium, but that um, for processing issues they won't be mined. Olympic Dam is the same issue. It's probably the biggest rare earth deposit in the world, but at the moment they just stockpile it because it's too expensive to process. Mount Well is producing rare earths. That's mostly light rare earths through Linus. And the other deposit that's um, producing is Brown's Range, the red dot up there. So that's um, Northern Minerals producing heavier earth concentrate, which they're now exporting. And that's uh, in a, a fairly unique ore style known as unconformity rare earth deposits. 
and there is a lot more potential for that all, over, all around um, northern Australia. The other mineralisation type we have in Australia is the blue dots, which is the peralkaline silicate magnus, and that's fairly well known across the world that these peralkaline intrusive complexes can host rare metal mineralisation. In Australia, it's a real, little bit unusual because the two known examples, Brockman's up the, in Northern Territory and Tungai over here, are both volcanic hosted. And this one here near Dubbo is uh, probably can, can be considered a world-class rare metal deposit. It has rare earths and zirconium and niobium and hafnium. And they're pretty close to going, they're raising money to try and set up their plant. And once they're operating, their mine life is supposed to be 50 to 70 years. So that's going to be a fairly long term project. And today I'm talking about Peak Ranges, which sits in here, which is also peralkaline volcanic hosted system, very similar to Tungai in, in a lot of ways. This is, Tungai is expected to be Jurassic, maybe, maybe younger, so it's a little bit different in age, but in general geology, it's fairly similar. All right, so let's have a closer look at what Peak Ranges is. This is uh, a map of the Cenozoic volcanics of Eastern Australia, intraplate volcanics. They're broken in a, in a number of different um, provinces. The ones really were of interest today are those central volcanic provinces shown in pink, and Peak Ranges sits right up the top there. There's a whole series of them that run through Queensland into New South Wales, and they have an age progression. They follow essentially hotspot tracks um, the best one known at the moment is this one running through here, the Cosgrove hotspot track, and Peak Ranges sits on that. It's about 30 odd million years ago that this uh, volcanic complex is erupting. And the other thing of note here is we have these colour codes for the Australian continent here, which correspond to thicknesses of the lithosphere that have been mapped out uh, by various methods, seismic tomography, etc. And you can see Peak Ranges, a lot of these things sit pretty close to where there is a, a step in the lithosphere where the lithosphere jumps from about 100 kilometres thick to 150 kilometres thick. So that's kind of interesting and is probably controlling this magnetism to some extent, but that's um, for another day. All right, zooming in a little bit further, um, here's where we are, Thompson origin, New England origin. This sits, Bowen Basin sits over here, the volcanics are sitting here, probably right on the, on the um, boundary between these two distinct crustal blocks if you like, which is probably also important for channeling these magmas towards the surface. And, uh, but it does sit, uh, it has intruded through the Bowen Basin. It's already in a uh, mining district. We have coal mines. There's a Dysart is just off the map up this way. The coal mines off here. Uh, Clermont is just off to the west. And the peak ranges are these uh, fairly spectacular domes and peaks running um, up through here. So the area where or that, that uh, Ross focused on was here in the south. And the interesting thing about this, this really stands out on the magnetic, on, on the uh, radiometrics. So this is a thorium map here, and you can see these bright spots lighting up here, which are these peralkaline volcanics. Over the other side, we see Ross's map of this area. This is only an honours project, so he didn't really get to do a, th uh, he did a pretty thorough job for an honours, but there's plenty more to do there. And he's looked at these uh, various domes and peaks, lava flow complexes, which have popped through the basalt plain. So this this uh, sort of tan color is all basalt. And each of them are fairly homogenous in, in terms of their rock type within each of these bodies. But there is a little bit of variation going from a uh, trachytes in black to the to rhyolitic compositions. Uh, hornblende or amphibole to pyroxene bearing rhyolites with uh, the green ones, which you can see are most uh, densely sampled, which are the, the yellow dots, they're being the most interest today. So this is what it looks like. This is one of uh, Ross's drone images. This dome here is actually number three there with all the, the um, yellow dots on it, Clary's dome. So you can see these are very um, pr prominent features in the landscape. They stick out above the basalt plains. Um, the rocks themselves, so I'm going to focus more on the rhyolites. Um, as I said, the uh, individual bodies are fairly homogenous. You see some uh, flow banding, lava, uh, yeah, flow banding, and you see some brecciation, but in general they're fairly uh, homogenous. There's not a lot to see within each body. They're fairly fine-grained 
rhyolites, um, some phenocrysts, some flow banding like this we see with bands of amphibole versus pyroxene bearing and uh, thin section pictures there. So nice quartz phenocrysts in a fine grain matrix. This is the agerine rhyolites, these nice green agerines. So agerine is a, is a sodium pyroxene we get in uh, as an igneous mineral occurs only in peralkaline magmas, so very alkali rich magmas. Uh, interstitial to the igneous mineral assemblage we see a whole bunch of what we would say are all minerals here, mostly zirconium minerals, so uh, eudiolite uh, sitting interstitial to quartz feldspar matrix and a mineral called dalliite, which if you haven't heard of dalliite, don't beat yourself up about it because it's a pretty rare mineral. So that's it up there, potassium, zirconium, silicate, and as far as we know, that's this guy here, this is the first time it's been reported from any rhyolite. So uh, an unusual phase, but these uh, alkali zirconium silicates also are very good at soaking up rare earths and niobium, etc. So this is where all the rare metals are sitting in these rocks. So we've interpreted that, or Ross has interpreted that, as a priming magmatic phase. So this is sitting in, in the uh, interstitial parts between the crystals, so late stage magmatic phase. But there is definitely a secondary phase as well, alteration phase we see this um, feathery uh, bassnesite, which is rare earth carbonate, and things which we kind of call zirconium gel. So it's fairly amorphous looking um, zirconium silicate as well. So these are probably produced by low temperature alteration or even weathering. But in general, that's, uh, as far as we can see, this hasn't mobilized rare earths or rare metals around much outside of probably a, the centimeter scale, or maybe tens of centimetres ago. Okay, a bit on the geochemistry. So this is fairly uh, showing you what we, we already know in a way. So a TAS diagram showing you most of these rocks are rhyolites. Uh, the colour codes here are for the different rock types. The one really of interest is these agerine rhyolites. These are the, the most rare metal enriched and they also tend to be the most peralkaline. So silica versus peralkaline and they head up here as we go into the the uh, Rebekite rhyolites and Adrian rhyolites. Here's uh, a little bit more geochemistry. So now we're using zirconium as a, as a bit of a monitor for the rare metal content. You can see zirconium contents going very high, over 5,000 ppm, and they correlate very well with other incompatible elements like thorium, niobium, yttrium representing a rare earth, even though it's not a rare earth, it's essentially a rare earth. Uh, shows that pattern as well, but it gets a lot more scatter at this end. So we do see some hydrothermal alteration of these things which are moving rare earths around. And the last one there is fluorine. We see a, a, quite a different trend with fluorine. So fluorine goes up and then drops off when we get to these agerine rhyolites. And that's also corresponding to the fact that these are hornblende bearing and these are peroxine bearing. So this is hydrous, this is anhydrous, and we interpret there's been a volatile loss between those two phases which is why the fluorine drops down as well. All right, uh, a quick look at radiogenic isotopes. I understand that most people don't really appreciate radiogenic isotopes as probably as much as I do, so I'm not gonna talk too much about this. Um, other than to say, it's a pretty simple story here. Here's our zirconium content again, going from the trachytes up to the rhyolites. And the isotopes, the neodymium isotopes, which are telling us about the source of the magmas, is sitting here at three and throughout that series it doesn't change, it stays the same. If we had uh, this evolution in magma types being affected by crustal assimilation or country rock uh, alteration, we would see this jumping way down here. So crustal rocks, old crustal basement rocks would be plotting way down this way. So the fact that this basically stays the same throughout is telling us this is fractionation controlled. So the magma evolution is just uh, crystal fractionation driving these high metal contents. Um, also uh, useful here is that the, the basalts in the region are in the same ballpark. There's a big range in the basalts, but these overlap with that. So that's telling us these magmas are mantle derived. So they're coming from, uh, essentially they were basalts or, or mafic magmas to some extent that have, have evolved, fractionated through this sequence. So a big Part of Ross's honours was to try and model this fractionation, and he did a really good job of it, combining uh, rhyolite melts, which is a um, freely available thermodynamic database set up to do this, 
but at some point this doesn't work for peralkaline magmas. It, it's, uh, the, uh, the data isn't available for those systems, so he had to do this manually. And the way he did this was look at the rocks, figure out what the phenocryst assemblage was, and then just do calculations subtracting those minerals away from the magmas and propagating the melt compositions. So uh, he started with an alkali basalt, which is most of the magma in the region, and then crystallized that through to our Adriene rhyolite at this end. And he could basically reproduce the magma compositions once he crystallized that pa parent magma by 99%. So really, really extreme levels of fractionation. And having some idea about the behavior of zirconium in these melts, it's fairly incompatible, but when we start getting down to these ends, it is slightly compatible into pyroxenes. We can see he modeled that and he gets up to the thousands of ppm zirconium as well. So he can model the melt compositions pretty well. He can also model the rare metal enrichment via this fractionation process. And this might seem pretty extreme, fractionating a magma to 99%, but in other places in the world where we see these sort of um, rare metal enrichment, these types of magma types, people have modeled this same sort of level of, of fractionation. So it's fairly consistent. All right, so his model for how this works, uh, it basically ties in with how we think these, all of these central chain volcanoes work. We have a hot spot, which um, the Australian continent is traveling over, a plume coming up underneath the, the lithosphere here. And this plume, various components of the plume, whether we have high degree melting of the mantle to make tholeotic basalts or lower degree melting, to make the alkaline basalts, or we even have the enriched lithosphere here. So we've, we know Eastern Australia has been subject to orogenesis over 500 million years or more. So we have an enriched lithosphere sitting underneath the crust. If we melt that, we also get fairly alkaline magmas. Uh, so that those erupt to make the basalts, the flood basalts, across most of the area. But for the southern peak range where, where these uh, where we're looking, we had some ponding at very shallow crustal levels here, and then that's where the extensive fractionation occurred to erupt these small domes uh, at the surface. Okay, so the economic considerations here. So how much rare metal really is there? Because these things are fairly uniform in terms of their composition you, of uh, you know the dozens of samples that Ross has taken across each of these domes, they the the uh, geochemistry varies very little. He was able to do a very much a back of the envelope type calculation on how much rare metal are in these things. Now we're just looking at the Adriene rhyolite. So these are the most enriched bodies. There's three of them. And Ross has calculated as about half a percent zirconium oxide, 0.13 total rare earth, so TREO is total rare earth oxides, and 0.09 niobium oxide. And you compare that to other ore deposits. So this is Tungai, Brockman's, Foxtrot, these are all peralkaline, volcanic hosted rare metal deposits, and the grades are a fair way behind that. So they're about a quarter of what Tungai is. Um, getting more similar to these guys in a lot of ways, but still pretty low grade at this point. Okay? Uh, but keep in mind, Tungai really is a big, is a big deposit. It's got a very long mine life. The other one down the bottom here, around Top Mountain, is, is actually a peraluminous rhyolite system in the US that they've been looking at as a um, very large tonnage, low grade deposit. There's no zirconium or niobium here, but 0.06% total rare earth. So peaks is about double that, but this is considered a very large tonnage deposit. So they're, they're considering this the porphyry style uh, system, the por uh, rare metal equivalent of porphyries. So what about tonnage then? We haven't put that up here. If we actually put that up here, then peak range start looking a lot better. So that's a fairly conservative estimate of the volume of, of these three domes, over 500 million tonnes, compared to 73 for Tungai, Tungai and 41, 34 for the others. And even compared to Round Top Mountain, it's double. So already as a large tonnage, low grade deposit, this is looking pretty promising. All right, so I'm almost done. Uh, this is really a summary. So in these particular <coughs> rhyolite systems, we've reached very relatively high, well, I would say very high rare metal contents in these magmas through extended fractional crystallization. You need peralkaline magmas to do this. 
because that prevents uh, saturation in minerals like zircon that would deplete the magma of rare metals. Uh, the prealkaline composition keeps them soluble, they, they stay in the magma for a very long time. Uh, so at the moment we could consider this a very high tonnage, very low grade deposit. Um, so a rare metal equivalent to a porphyry, but keep in mind this is one honours project so far. There's very little work done there. Uh, and there is lots of potential for um, higher grade zones to be found in these things. So we know that there is hydrothermal alteration going on. We can see in some samples that rare metal, uh, the rare earths are being moved by hydrothermal alteration. So there's possibility that we see higher grade zones produced either by hydrothermal alteration or even zones where we've had even further fractional crystallization to reach higher metal grades. So lots of potential in the peak ranges. And I think the central chain volcanoes that run all the way down eastern Australia, there's actually a lot of potential in those for rare metal deposits. Most of them are basaltic, which is not going to be very useful, but there are places like peak ranges where we do get these peralkaline silicate, silica rich systems forming that um, probably should be looked at for their, for their rare earth potential. All right, I'm going to finish with another shameless promotion of our conference in a couple of weeks um, to back up Yambo the other day. Tin tungsten critical metals up on the tablelands. Uh, it's going to be a, a pretty exciting conference. We've got speakers coming from all over the world um, for this and registration is still open. If you haven't registered yet, I encourage you to, to do so uh, and you can contact any of us at EGRU about that or go onto the website and sign up. Okay, that's all. Thanks.